The Columbia, The Mighty Rive of the West, Part 2. Roll on, Columbia, roll on. Roll on. Table Columbia, of Contents, on, The Columbia River, Part 2. All about the Columbia River and the nearby Columbia, regions of Oregon and Washington. With visiting and touring information, Other great geography, history, Yakima attractions, and, and author points of interest. Dr. Sydney Soclough. Dr. Sydney22 at gmail.com. 2022. Narration by Dr. Sydney Soclough. Zoe Phonemes. And Nathan Coltove. For a complete discussion of YouTube navigation, please go to tiny.one slash YT Navigator. Steamboats on the Columbia River. No power is turning out. Many steamboats operated on the Columbia River and its tributaries from about 1850 to 1981. Major tributaries of the Columbia that formed steamboat routes included the Willamette and Snake Rivers. Early operations on the Columbia were almost exclusively confined to the lower river. The first steamboat to arrive in Oregon was the Beaver, which was built in England and arrived at Oregon City in 1836. In the 1840s and 1850s, Ocean-going ships equipped with auxiliary steam engines were able to come up the lower river as far as Portland, Oregon and Fort Vancouver. However, there was no other steamboat in the region until the Sidewheeler Columbia was launched in early June 1850 at Astoria. The Columbia made the Oregon City Portland Astoria run twice a month at 4 miles per hour, charging $25 per passenger and $25 per ton of freight. The Columbia held a monopoly on the river until December 25, 1850, when the sidewheeler lot Whitcomb was launched at Milwaukee, Oregon. The lot Whitcomb was able to run upriver 120 miles, 190 kilometers, from Astoria to Oregon City in 10 hours compared to the Columbia's two days. The Shaver Transportation Company is an inland water freight transportation company based in Portland, Oregon, United States. The company was founded in 1880 and played a major role in the development of freight transport in the Portland area and along the Columbia. Dams There are more than 60 dams in the Columbia River watershed in the United States and Canada. Many of the dams in the Columbia River watershed were not created for the specific purposes of water storage or flood protection. Instead, the primary purpose of many of these dams is to produce hydroelectricity. The Columbia's extreme elevation drop over a relatively short distance 2,700 feet in 1,232 miles, or 822 meters in 1,982 kilometers, gives it tremendous potential for hydroelectricity generation. It was estimated in the 1960s and 70s that the Columbia represented one-fifth of the total world hydroelectric capacity. The Columbia drops 2.16 feet per mile.41 meters per kilometer, as compared with the Mississippi which drops less than 0.66 feet per mile.13 meters per kilometer. Today, the mainstream of the Columbia River has 14 dams, 3 in Canada and 11 in the United States. Full mainstream dams and full Wee Snake River dams have locks to allow ship and barge passage. Numerous Columbian River tributaries have dams for hydroelectric and irrigation purposes. While well, hydroelectricity accounts for only 6.5% of energy in the United States, the Columbia and its tributaries provide approximately 60% of the hydroelectric power on the West Coast. 
the largest of the 150 hydroelectric projects. The Columbia's Grand Coulee and the Chief Joseph Dam, both in Washington State, are also the largest in the U.S. And the Grand Coulee is the third largest in the world. Major dam construction began in the early 20th century and picked up the pace after the Columbia River Treaty in the 1960s. By the mid-1980s all the big dams were finished. Of the 60 dams in the watershed, 14 are on the Columbia, 20 on the Snake, 7 on the Kootenay, 7 on the Ponderé Clark, 2 on the Flathead, 8 on the Yakima, and 2 on the Oahe. Here we see the basic structure of a hydroelectric dam. Water from the reservoir flows through a penstock and spins a turbine before re-entering the river downstream. The spinning turbine turns a generator in the powerhouse to generate electricity. The electricity is stepped up in voltage by transformers, and then transmitted at a high voltage over long-distance power transmission lines. Averaging a major dam every 72 miles, 116 kilometers, the rivers in the Columbia watershed combine to create over 36,000 megawatts of power. Grand Coulee Dam is the largest producer of hydroelectric power in the United States, creating 6,809 megawatts, over one-sixth of all power in the basin. It is the sixth largest in the world. Here we see the elevation of the hydroelectric plants along the Columbia and Snake Rivers. We can now understand the prodigious energy generation capacity of the Grand Coulee Dam because of the large height of the water behind the dam and the large amount of water stored behind the dam. In contrast to the Grand Coulee Dam, the dams on the lower Columbia River in the area of the gorge from Bonneville to the Dalles, John Day, and McNary are much lower in dam height and much smaller in water storage. These dams are called run-of-the-river dams. Run-of-the-river hydroelectricity is a type of hydroelectric generation plant in which there is little or no water storage. These power plants may have a limited amount of water storage to regulate the flow against the seasonal variations of the river. Here is a list of the top seven producers of hydroelectric power in the U.S. We see that Grand Coulee is by far the largest producer of hydroelectric power in the U.S. Four of the top seven producers listed here are dams on the Columbia River. Grand Coulee at number one. Chief Joseph Dam at number three. John Day at number five. And the Dalles Dam at number seven. We see that Grand Coulee produces almost three times the power on the U.S. side of Niagara Falls and more than three times that of Hoover Dam. The Bath County Pump Storage Station is not a conventional dam, but a pump storage hydroelectric power plant, which can be described as the largest battery in the world in which water is pumped between two reservoirs to supply power during times of peak demand. In addition to providing ample power for the people of the Pacific Northwest, the reservoirs created by the dams have created numerous recreational opportunities, including fishing, boating, and windsurfing. Furthermore, by creating a constant flow and consistent depth along the river channel, the series of locks and dams have allowed for Clarkston, Washington, and Lewiston, Idaho to become the furthest inland seaports on the west coast of the United States. The Columbia Basin Project in central Washington is the irrigation network that the Grand Coulee Dam makes possible. It is the largest water reclamation project in the United States, supplying irrigation water to over 670,000 acres, 2,700 square kilometers. Water pumped from the Columbia River is carried over 331 miles, 533 kilometers, of main canals, stored in a number of reservoirs, 
then fed into 1,339 miles, 2,155 kilometers, of lateral irrigation canals, and out into 3,500 miles, 5,600 kilometers, of drains and washways. Franklin D. Roosevelt Lake, also called Lake Roosevelt, is the reservoir created in 1941 by the impoundment of the Columbia River by the Grand Coulee Dam in Washington. It is named for Franklin D. Roosevelt, who was president during the construction of the dam. Covering 125 square miles, Lake Roosevelt stretches about 150 miles, 240 kilometers, from the Canadian border to Grand Coulee Dam with over 600 miles, 970 kilometers, of shoreline. By surface area, it is the largest lake and reservoir in Washington. The total amount of the Columbia flow that is diverted into the Columbia Basin project at Grand Coulee varies a little from year to year, and is currently about 3.0 million acre feet. This is about 2.3% of the average flow on the lower river as measured at the Dalles. This amount is larger than the entire annual flow of the Colorado River at the Mexican border. 6% of the Columbia River Basin's yearly runoff is diverted to irrigate about 7.8 million acres of land. Much of the water that is diverted eventually finds its way back into the river system. Farmers in arid parts of eastern Washington, northeastern Oregon, and southern Idaho depend on irrigation to support crops such as wheat, corn, potatoes, peas, alfalfa, apples, and grapes. The Columbia Basin Project has turned the high desert area of central Washington into another breadbasket for America. The centerpiece is the Grand Coulee Dam which was built primarily as an irrigation project by the Bureau of Reclamation. Water stored behind Grand Coulee Dam in Lake Roosevelt is pumped into Banks Lake. Banks Lake was formed by damming both ends of the Grand Coulee, which is one of the geological formations that dates back to Ice Age floods. The term Coulee comes from the French-Canadian Calais from the French word caler meaning to flow, in the northwest U.S. Calais are commonly canyons characterized by steep walls that have been shaped by erosion. The water then flows through a system of tunnels and canals to irrigate croplands. The project irrigates over 500,000 acres and has the potential to be expanded to irrigate over 1.1 million acres. The Bonneville Lock and Dam completed in 1937, consists of several run-of-the-river dam structures that together complete a span of the Columbia River between Oregon and Washington at River Mile 146. The dam is located 40 miles, 64 kilometers, east of Portland, in the Columbia River Gorge. The primary functions of Bonneville Lock and Dam are electrical power generation and river navigation, the dam was built and is managed by the United States Army Corps of Engineers. Electrical power generated at Bonneville is distributed by the Bonneville Power Administration. Bonneville Lock and Dam is named for Army Captain Benjamin Bonneville, an early explorer accredited with charting much of the Oregon Trail. The Bonneville Dam Historic District was designated a National Historic Landmark District in 1987. This is a diagram of the Bonneville Lock and Dam. Note the navigation lock in the fish ladder. The Dalles Dam is a concrete gravity run of the river dam spanning the Columbia River. Two miles, three kilometers, east of the city of the Dalles, Oregon. 192 miles, 309 kilometers, upriver from the mouth of the Columbia near Astoria. The Army Corps of Engineers began work on the dam in 1952 and completed it five years later. The water impounded by the dam submerged Salillo Falls, 
the economic and cultural hub of Native Americans in the region and the oldest continuously inhabited settlement in North America. On March 10, 1957, hundreds of observers looked on as the rising waters rapidly silenced the falls, submerged fishing platforms, and consumed the village of Salilo. The amount of salmon harvested at Salilo had supported a huge trading center, attracting tribes from as far as the Great Lakes, the southwest, and northwest coast. For 11,000 years, Salilo Falls was the most significant economic and cultural hub for native peoples on the Columbia. It was located east of the modern city of the Dells. An estimated 15 to 20 million salmon pass through the falls every year, making it one of the greatest fishing sites in North America. The falls served as the center of an extensive trading network across the Pacific Plateau. It was the oldest continuously inhabited community on the North American continent until 1957, when it was submerged by the construction of the Dalles Dam and the native fishing community was displaced. The affected tribes received a $26.8 million settlement for the loss of Sililo and other fishing sites submerged by the Dalles Dam. The Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs used part of its $4 million settlement to establish the Con Ato Resort south of Mount Hood. The reservoir behind the dam is named Lake Silillo and runs 24 miles, 39 kilometers, up the river channel, to the foot of John Day Dam. The dam is operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and the power is marketed by the Bonneville Power Administration. The Dales Dam Visitor Center, in Sufert Park on the Oregon Shore, was built in 1981. This is the Dales Dam Visitor Center. The John Day Dam, completed in 1971, is a concrete gravity run of the river dam spanning the Columbia River. The dam features a navigation lock plus fish ladders on both sides. The John Day Lock is the highest lift, 110 feet, of any U.S. lock. The reservoir impounded by the dam is Lake Umatilla, and it runs 76 miles, 123 kilometers, up the river channel to the foot of the McNary Dam. Construction of the dam began in 1958 and was completed in 1971 making it the newest dam on the Lowy Columbia. At a total cost of dollar, five hundred and eleven million. John Day Dam was built and operated by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. McNary Dam, completed in 1954, is a 1.4 mile, 2.2 kilometers long concrete gravity run of the river dam which spans the Columbia River, 292 miles, 470 kilometers, upriver from the mouth of the Columbia. The dam is located a mile, 2 kilometers, east of the town of Umatilla, Oregon, and 8 miles, 13 kilometers, north of Hermiston, Oregon. The dam was originally planned to be named Umatilla Dam. But the Flood Control Act of 1945 renamed the dam in honor of Senator Charles L. McNary of Oregon, who had died the previous year. The Pacific Salmon Visitor Information Center at McNary Dam offers audiovisual programs and talks on salmon and hydropower. Dams on the Snake River Here are dams on the Snake River. Ice Harbor Lock and Dam, built in 1961 and 1976, is a hydroelectric, concrete gravity run of the river dam on the Snake River in Washington. The dam is located 12 miles, 19 kilometers, east of Pasco, at River Mile 9.7. Its name comes from a tiny bay in the river where boats once tied up to wait for upstream ice jams to break up. 
Construction began in June 1955. The main structure and three generators we completed in 1961. With three additional generators finished in 1976. Generating capacity is 603 megawatts. With an overload capacity of 693 MW. The spillway has 10 gates and is 590 feet 180 meters long. A large Visito Sinta is inside the Ice Harbor Dam on the south side of the Snake River. The Visito Sinta also has a fishlet a viewing room which offers an excellent view of migrating salmon, steelhead, and shad. The Lower Monumental Lock and Dam, completed in 1969, is a hydroelectric, concrete, run-of-the-river dam on the Snake River in Washington. Construction began in June 1961. The main structure and three generators were completed in 1969. Little Goose Lock and Dam, completed in 1970 is a hydroelectric, concrete, run-of-the-river dam in Washington on the Snake River. Construction began in 1963 on what was Little Goose Island. The main structure and three generators were completed in 1970, with an additional three generators finished in 1978. Lower Granite Lock and Dam completed in 1975 and 1987, is a concrete gravity run of the river dam. The Columbia River Gorge The Columbia River Gorge is a canyon of the Columbia River. Up to 4,000 feet, 1,300 meters, deep, the canyon stretches for over 80 miles, 130 kilometers, as the river winds through the Cascade Range. The canyon of the Columbia River forms the boundary between the state of Washington to the north and Oregon to the south. Extending roughly from the confluence of the Columbia with the Deschutes River down to the eastern reaches of the Portland metropolitan area, the water gap furnishes the only navigable route through the Cascades and the only water connection between the Columbia River Plateau and the Pacific Ocean. The Gorge holds federally protected status as a national scenic area called the Columbia Gorge National Scenic Area and is managed by the Columbia River Gorge Commission and the U.S. Forest Service. The Gorge is a popular recreational destination. This shows the Gorge extending from Trout Dale, just east of Portland to the Dells. The Columbia River, Klamath River in Northern California, and Fraser River in southern British Columbia are the only three rivers connecting the east side watersheds of the Cascade Mountain Range to the Pacific Ocean. Each river has created a gorge through the Cascade Mountain Range. The wide range of elevation and precipitation makes the Columbia River Gorge an extremely diverse and dynamic place. Elevations range from 4,000 feet, 1,200 meters, down to sea level, and precipitation from 100 inches, 2,500 millimeters, to only 10 inches, 250 millimeters, in just 80 miles, 130 kilometers. The gorge creates a diverse collection of ecosystems from the temperate rainforest on the western end, with an average annual precipitation of 75 to 100 inches. 1,900 to 2,500 millimeters, to the eastern grasslands with average annual precipitation between 10 and 15 inches, 250 and 380 millimeters. Isolated microhabitats have allowed many endemic plants and animals to prosper, including at least 13 endemic wildflowers. Atmospheric pressure differentials east and west of the Cascades create a wind tunnel effect in the deep cut of the gorge, generating 35 miles per hour, 56 kilometers per hour, 
winds that make it a popular windsurfing and kitasurfing location as well as wind turbines for generating electricity. The gorge is known for its high concentration of waterfalls, with over 90 on the Oregon side alone. Many waterfalls along the historic Columbian River Highway, including the notable 620-foot, 190 meters high Multnomah Falls. Multnomah Falls, 30 miles east of Portland, is Oregon's tallest waterfall. This is Multnomah Falls in 1857, as painted by James W. Alden. This is Waklala Falls. This is Wakina Falls and Footbridge. This is Upper Horsedale Falls. This is Lateral Falls. This is Upper Bridal Vale Falls. This is Upper Aniana Falls. This is the Columbia River Crown Point Vista House near Multnomah Falls. The Vista House is an observatory at Crown Point that also serves as a memorial to Oregon pioneers on the historic Columbia River Highway. On a rocky promontory, the site is 733 feet 223 meters above the Columbia River on the south side of the Columbia River Gorge. The Columbia River Crown Point Vista House is listed on the National Register of Historic Places. The Columbia Gorge Interpretive Center Museum presents the gorge's inhabitants and natural history through photos, replicas and displays. It is located in Stevenson, Washington near Cascade Locks and just upstream from Bonneville Dam. The Mary Hill Museum of Art is a small museum with an eclectic collection on a bluff overlooking the eastern end of the Columbia River Gorge. The structure was originally intended as a mansion for entrepreneur Samuel Hill, 1857-1931. The unfinished museum building was dedicated in 1926 and opened to the public on Hill's birthday, May 13, in 1940. The Mary Hill Museum building was designed as a private residence for Sam Hill in a Beaux-Arts style and built of steel-reinforced concrete beginning in 1914. Hill imagined the structure as a ranch building amidst a 5,300-acre agricultural community that he was developing at the eastern end of the Columbia River Gorge. During a 1917 visit by his friend Loy Fuller, he decided to turn his unfinished home into a museum for the public good. And for the betterment of French art in the far northwest of America, Hill's contribution to the new museum included almost 90 American Indian baskets, more than 70 Rodin sculptures in watercolors, and many personal items. The museum's first physical expansion was completed when the Mary and Bruce Stevenson Wing opened to the public in 2012. It includes a plaza that overlooks the Columbia River, an education center, a collection suite and a cafe. Mary Hill's Stonehenge was erected as the nation's first World War I memorial and was dedicated in 1918 to the servicemen of Clickadat County. Washington, who died in the service of their country during the Great War. Hill erroneously believed that the original Stonehenge was constructed as a place of human sacrifice, concluding there was a parallel between the loss of life in World War I and the sacrifices at ancient Stonehenge. He set up to build a replica on the cliffs of the Columbia River as a reminder of those sacrifices and the incredible folly of the war. Guided by leading authorities on archaeology, astronomy, and engineering, Hill combined their knowledge to duplicate, as nearly as possible, the original size and design of the ancient Neolithic ruin of Schianohenge in England. 
Cascade locks. Cascade locks. Oregon took its name from a set of locks built to improve navigation past the Cascades Rapids of the Columbia River. The U.S. federal government approved the plan for the locks in 1875. Construction began in 1878. And the locks we completed in 1896. The locks we subsequently submerged in 1938 by Lake Bonneville and replaced by Bonneville Lock and Dam. Ho waiver. The city lost no land from the expansion of Lake Bonneville behind the dam some four miles six kilometers downstream of the town. The city population is 1,100 residents. This is a penny postcard. Circa 1920. Cascade Locks. Columbia River. Oregon. The caption on the back reads. Cascade Locks. Seen from the highway. Constructed by the government at an expense of nearly $3 million to overcome the unnavigable rapids of the Cascades, the locks raise steamers 20 feet and enables them to pass around the Cascades. The Indian legend has it that the rapids were formed by the fall of the fabled bridge of the gods that once spanned the Columbia River. This is a penny postcard. Circa 1910. Of the steamer Bailey Gatsert entering the locks of the Cascades. This is a penny postcard. Circa 1910. Columbia River Steamers and Cascade Locks. Cascade Locks is just upstream from the Bridge of the Gods. A toll bridge that spans the Columbia River. It is the only bridge across the Columbia between Portland and Hood River. The Bridge of the Gods originally was a natural dam created by the Bonneville Slide, a major landslide that dammed the Columbia River near present-day Cascade Locks. The river eventually breached the bridge and washed much of it away. But the event is remembered in local legends of the Native Americans as the Bridge of the Gods. The Cascade Locks Marine Park is along the Columbia River at the location of the remains of the Cascade. Locks in, the park is the Cascade Locks Historical Museum, housed in one of the three original locks tenders houses, and the Oregon Pony, the first steam engine in the Pacific Northwest. In 2006 the Cascade Locks Marine Park featured two life-size cutouts of seamen, Captain Lewis's Newfoundland dog who made the entry journey with Lewis and Clark. In 2011 two bronzes we dedicated. One for Sacagawea and Pomp and the other for Captain Lewis's dog Seaman. There is also a walking bridge crossing the remains of the locks. This is a plaque dedicated to Captain Lewis's Newfoundland dog. Seaman, who made the entire journey with Lewis and Clark. The Stern Wheeler Columbia Gorge is based out of the Cascade Locks Marine Park, offering day excursions on the river. The Dalles The Dalles is the county seat and largest city of Wasco County, Oregon. The Dalles is the second largest city on the Oregon side of the Columbia River after Portland, with a population of 15,000. This exceeds the population of Astoria which is 9,500. The site of what is now the city of the Dells was a major Native American trading center for at least 10,000 years. Lewis and Clark camped near Mill Creek in October 1805. The name of the city comes from the French-Canadian word Dells meaning a stretch of a river between high rock walls, with rapids and dangerous currents. The same origin is for Wisconsin Dells, except spelled and pronounced a little differently. Early French explorers named the Dells of the Wisconsin River as Dells, a rapids or narrows on a river in Voyageur French. An important museum in the Dells is the Columbia Gorge Discovery Center and Museum.
The purpose of the museum is to bring to life the human stories and natural history of the Columbia River Gorge and the surrounding region through the collection preservation and interpretation of cultural and natural history. Fort Dalles Museum in the Dalles is housed in the former surgeon's quarters, the only remaining officer's quarters of the 1856 Fort Dalles military complex. One of Oregon's oldest history museums. It first opened its doors in 1905. The Tri-Cities area of Richland, Kenwick, and Pasco. This is the Tri-Cities area of Richland, Kenwick, and Pasco, plus some smaller communities. The three cities are contiguous making it one continuous urban area with a population of 270,000. This makes it the fourth largest metropolitan area in Washington. After Seattle, Tacoma, Spokane, and the Vancouver part of the Portland metropolitan area. The Tri-Cities area of Richland, Kenwick, and Pasco is just above the confluence of the Columbia and Snake Rivers. This is in the state of Washington, just before the big bend of the Columbia River, where it makes a wide curve in its course from flowing south to flowing west toward the Pacific Ocean. Here we have the confluence of the Columbia and Snake Rivers and the Tri-Cities area of Richland, Kenwick, and Pasco. The Yakima River, a smaller tributary of the Columbia River, flows into the Columbia between Richland and Kenwick. This is a view from the highest hill overlooking the Tri-Cities area. The Hanford Site A principal industry and employer of the Tri-Cities area is the Hanford Site. The Hanford site is a mostly decommissioned nuclear production complex operated by the federal government on the Columbia River. It has been known by many names, including Hanford Project, Hanford Works, Hanford Engineer Works, and Hanford Nuclear Reservation. The Hanford site was established in 1943 as part of the Manhattan Project in the town of Hanford along the Columbia River just above Richland in the Tri-Cities area. It was home to the B reactor, the first full-scale plutonium production reactor in the world. Plutonium manufactured at the site was used in the first nuclear bomb, tested at the Trinity site in July 1945. And in Fat Man, the bomb detonated over Nagasaki, Japan in August 1945. During the Cold War, the project expanded to include nine nuclear reactors and five large plutonium processing complexes, which produced plutonium for most of the more than 60,000 weapons in the U.S. nuclear arsenal. Nuclear technology developed rapidly during this period and Hanford scientists produce notable technological achievements. The weapons production reactors we decommissioned at the end of the Cold War. Decades of manufacturing left behind 53 million gallons, 200,000 cubic meters of high-level radioactive waste stored within 177 storage tanks. An additional 25 million cubic feet, 710,000 cubic meters of solid radioactive waste. And 200 square miles, 520 square kilometers of contaminated groundwater beneath the site. In 2007, the Hanford site represented two-thirds of the nation's high-level radioactive waste by volume. Hanford is currently the most contaminated nuclear site in the United States and is the focus of the nation's largest environmental cleanup. Hanford also hosts a commercial nuclear power plant, the Columbia Generating Station, and various centers for scientific research and development, 
such as the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory. This is one of the national laboratories of the Department of Energy. Scientists at the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory conduct basic and applied research and development to strengthen U.S. scientific foundations for fundamental research and innovation, prevent and counter acts of terrorism through applied research in information analysis, cybersecurity, and the non-proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. The research also aims to increase the U.S. energy capacity, reduce dependence on imported oil, and reduce the effects of human activity on the environment. Battelle Memorial Institute has operated this laboratory since 1965. The Hanford site occupies 586 square miles, 1,518 square kilometers, which is roughly equivalent to half of the total area of Rhode Island. It is closed to the general public. It is a desert environment, and the Columbia River flows along the site for approximately 50 miles, 80 kilometers, forming its northern and eastern boundary. The Hanford Reach National Monument is a national monument in the state of Washington. The Hanford Reach National Monument was created in 2000, mostly from the former security buffer surrounding the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, Hanford Site. The area has been untouched by development or agriculture since 1943. The monument is named after the Hanford Reach. The last non-tidal, free-flowing section of the Columbia River in the United States above Bonneville Dam. President Bill Clinton established the monument by presidential decree in 2000. It is one of only two national monuments administered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Ancestors of the Wanapum people, Yakima Nation, Confederated Tribes of the Colville, Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Reservation, and the Nez Perce use the land for hunting and resource collecting. The New Hanford Reach Interpretive Sinte, known locally as the Reach, opened in 2014. The museum and Visito Sinta displays the natural and cultural history of the Hanford Reach of the Columbia River and the Greater Columbia Basin. As a gateway to the Hanford Reach National Monument, the Interpretive Center exhibits the agricultural history, advancements in technology, the Manhattan Project National Park, the Ice Age floods and other stories of the community along the Columbia River. The hybrid institution will be part museum, interpretive center, and visitor center. A series of dynamic audio-visual components will enhance exhibits. The Columbia Generating Station is 10 miles upriver from Richland and is the only nuclear power station in the Pacific Northwest. It used a boiling water reactor and was relicensed to operate until 2043. After nine years of construction, the plant began operating after a long and costly construction process that resulted in the largest municipal failure in U.S. history. Originally operated and owned by the Washington Public Power Supply System, WPPSS, the coalition changed its name to Energy Northwest in 1998. The name change was because of the negative association with the original name commonly pronounced hoops in place of WPPSS. WPPSS defaulted on $2.25 billion in bonds resulting in payments that exceeded $12,000 per customer, an amount which was finally paid out in 1992, 10 years later. The plant currently supplies 8.9% of the state of Washington's power and has safeguards to protect against seismic, natural, or terrorist threats. 
Pendleton. Pendleton was developed along the Umatilla River and was named in 1868 by the county commissioners for George H. Pendleton, Democratic candidate for vice president in the 1864 presidential campaign. The population of Pendleton is 17,000, and it is the county seat of Umatilla County. Pendleton is the smaller of the two principal cities of the Hermiston-Pendleton metropolitan area. This metropolitan area covers Moro and Umatilla counties and has a combined population of 90,000. Pendleton is 30 miles southeast of Umatilla on the Columbia River and 42 miles by road. Pendleton Woolen Mills is a maker of wool blankets, shirts, and an assortment of other woolen goods. It was founded in 1909 by Clarence. Roy and Chauncey Bishop, and built upon earlier businesses related to the many sheep ranches in the region. A wool scouring plant opened in Pendleton in 1893 to wash raw wool for shipping. In 1895, the scouring mill was converted into a mill that made wool blankets and robes for Native Americans. Both businesses did not survive, but the bishops, with the help of a local bond issue, enlarged the mill and improved its efficiency. The Pendleton Woolen Mills developed a successful line of garments and blankets with vivid colors and intricate patterns. The Pendleton Woolen Mills Mount St. Helens Mount St. Helens is in the state of Washington 96 miles. 154 kilometers south of Seattle and 50 miles 80 kilometers northeast of Portland. Mount St. Helens is 37 miles or 60 kilometers from the Columbia River at Longview, Washington and 45 miles or 72 kilometers from Vancouver. By road it is a 60 mile or 1.5 hours trip from Vancouver. Mount St. Helens had a catastrophic eruption on May 18, 1980, at 8.32 a.m. Pacific Daylight Time. It was the greatest volcanic explosion ever recorded in North America and the deadliest and most economically destructive volcanic event in the history of the United States. This is Mount St. Helens the day before the 1980 eruption, which removed much of the northern face of the mountain, leaving a large crater. Mount St. Helens was named by the English navigator George Vancouver for a British ambassador, and had been dormant since 1857. Fifty-seven people were killed, and 250 homes, 47 bridges, 15 miles, 24 kilometers of railway tracks and 185 miles 298 kilometers of highway were destroyed a massive debris avalanche triggered by an earthquake measuring 5.1 on the richter scale caused an eruption that reduced the elevation of the mountain's summit from 9677 feet 2950 meters to 8,363 feet, 2,549 meters. The mountain's summit was replaced by a horseshoe-shaped crater that is 1 mile, 1.6 kilometers, wide. The debris avalanche was up to 0.7 cubic miles, 2.9 cubic kilometers, in volume. Plumes of steam. Gas and ash often occurred at Mount St. Helens in the early 1980s. On clear days they could be seen from Portland, 50 miles, 80 kilometers, to the south. The plume photographed here rose nearly 3,000 feet, 910 meters, above the volcano's rim. The ashfall created some temporary problems with transportation, sewage disposal, and water treatment systems. 
visibility was greatly decreased, closing many highways and roads. Interstate 90 from Seattle to Spokane was closed for a week and a half. Air travel was disrupted for between a few days and two weeks, and over a thousand commercial flights were canceled following airport closures. This is a view of the crater of Mount St. Helens. The Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument was created in 1982 to preserve the volcano and allow for its aftermath to be scientifically studied. The National Monument is administered by the U.S. Forest Service and is part of Gifford Pinchot National Forest. This is the visitor center of the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument. Visitors can view the crater, lava dome, pumice plain, and effects of the landslide from the Johnston Ridge Observatory on the monument's west side, less than 5 miles, 8 kilometers, from the volcano. Clarkston and Lewiston Clarkston is a city in Asoton County, Washington. It is part of the Clarkston-Lewiston metropolitan area, and is located west of Lewiston, Idaho, across the Snake River. The population of Clarkston is 7,300 and that of Lewiston is 32,000. The Clarkston-Lewiston metropolitan area population is 62,000. Clarkston is a city in Asoton County, Washington. It is part of the Clarkston-Lewiston metropolitan area and is located west of Lewiston, Idaho, across the Snake River. The population of Clarkston is 7,300 and that of Lewiston is 32,000. The Clarkston-Lewiston metropolitan area population is 62,000. The name Clarkston is a reference to William Clark, of Lewis and Clark fame. Lewiston across the Idaho state line from Clarkston, is named for Meriwether Lewis, and is the larger and older of the two cities. Neither Lewis nor Clark ever visited the location of these two cities. Clarkston was first settled 154 years ago in 1862 by Robert Bracken, and was officially incorporated in 1902. Before becoming an official town, the area was called Jawbone Flats. The port of Clarkston is home to one of the largest cranes on a navigable waterway east of Portland. Agriculture is a major industry in the area and the port handles a lot of barge traffic carrying grains. A major industry is the Clearwater Paper Corporation which transports wood chips and sawdust via barges for use at a Lewiston manufacturing plant. Due to its inland location on the Snake River, the port handles goods routed out to Portland, Vancouver, and inland distributors upstream. The Clarkston Marina has accommodations for personal boats and yachts, many of which travel through the nearby Hell's Canyon climate of the Columbia River region. The Columbia River Basin's climate is strongly affected by orographic influences, and is partly continental and partly marine. The Rocky Mountains to the east block out most of the severe winter storms of the interior of the continent, and the Cascade Range to the west shields the basin from moist Pacific Ocean air. Summers are typically hot and dry with only occasional thunder showers. Winters are moderately cold and dry with occasional snow or even rain. Temperature and precipitation vary greatly with elevation, but in the central basin January average daily temperatures are between about 25 and 30 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 4 and minus 1 degree Celsius. In July averages are mostly between 70 and 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 and 24 degrees Celsius. Average annual precipitation ranges from less than 8 inches, 20 centimeters, at the lowest elevations to about 15 inches, 38 centimeters, 
near the mountain foothills and 40 inches, 100 centimeters, or more in the mountains. West of the Cascades the climate is marine-influenced, with long, rainy winters and cool, dry summers. Along the coast a precipitation is essentially all in the form of rainfall and totals around 150 to 400 centimeters, or 60 to 160 inches annually. Beyond the coast range in the Willamette Valley and further north into Washington, the annual rainfall is 100 to 150 centimeters, or 40 to 60 inches. In the Cascades, the precipitation is about the same as in the coast range in the rain shadow beyond the Cascades in the Columbia Plateau the precipitation drops off rapidly down to just 15 to 25 centimeters or 6 to 10 inches. This puts this region into the desert range of less than 10 inches of annual precipitation. Will it be hot? Or will it be cold? Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Astoria. We see that summers are cool with high temperatures only in the mid to high 60s. Winters are moderate with highs near 50 and lows in the high 30s. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in Astoria. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in Astoria. We see that the rainy season is from October through April. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in Astoria. We see that it rains slightly more than half of the days in a year in the rainiest months of December and January. It rains two days out of three. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Portland. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in Portland. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in Portland. We see that the rainy season is from November through March. Here is the average number of rainy days throughout the year in Portland. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in the Dells. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in the Dells. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in the Dells. We see that the rainy season is from November through February. Here is the average number of rainy days throughout the year in the Dells. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Richland. Washington in the Tri-Cities area. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in Richland. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in Richland. We see that the total yearly rainfall is very small, less than 8 inches, which represents desert conditions. Here is the average number of rainy days throughout the year in Richland. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit throughout the year in Lewiston, Idaho which is directly across the Snake River from Clarkston in Washington. Here are the average high and low temperatures in degrees Celsius throughout the year in Lewiston. Here is the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year in Lewiston. We see that the total yearly rainfall is quite small. Only 13.2 inches, barely above desert conditions. Here is the average number of rainy days throughout the year in Lewiston. Here we have the average monthly rainfall in inches throughout the year going from Astoria near the coast to Clarkston and Lewiston in the interior near the Rocky Mountains. We see the effect of the rain shadow due to the coast range with the decrease in the rainfall in Portland in the Willamette Valley. 
There is an even greater rain shadow effect caused by the Cascade Mountains causing the reduced rainfall in the Dells and even more so in Richland. There is a slight increase in rain in Lewiston near the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Recommended videos, Columbia River, Part 2 Recommended video, The Mighty Columbia River, 1947 Recommended video, History Short, Steamboats Recommended video, Historic Columbian River Highway and Waterfalls. Recommended video, American Cruise Lines, Columbia and Snake River Cruise. Recommended video, American Empress, Sailing the Columbia River. Recommended video, America, Promised Land. Migrants travel west on the Oregon Trail. Table of Contents, The Columbia River, Part 2 Thanks for watching. Please watch some more of my great videos.